What is going on, Boiler Nation? It's Friday, November 24th, 2023. A brand new episode of the Boiler Breakdown Podcast coming your way. Doing it a little differently this evening. Not recording live and recording just me, myself, and I, Tanner Lee. Uh, co host Evan Webb, Andrew Eiler, uh, busy with families and busy uh, traveling back into the country. Um, so it's just me. So uh, bear with me as I'm going to be re- recapping a huge week in Purdue sports with the men's basketball team winning the Maui Invitational, the most loaded field of the Maui Invitational of all time, one of the most loaded non-conference tournaments of all time. And uh, Purdue will certainly be ranked number one for the third consecutive year uh, starting next week, which will be awesome. So recapping that, uh, we'll shortly recap Purdue's loss at Northwestern football since it was almost a week ago uh, as of last Saturday. And we'll be previewing uh, tomorrow's battle for the old Oaken Bucket against those uh, Indiana Hoosiers from that school down south. Um, before we get into everything, please give us a like. Subscribe, follow, hit that notification bell on YouTube, all those good things. You can uh, find us on YouTube, like I just said, Twitter slash X, whatever you want to call it, Instagram and Facebook at Boiler Break Pod is our handles on all of those platforms. And if you're uh, listening to this on your favorite podcast platform, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you might listen to the Boiler Breakdown at, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And give us a rating and review. That really helps us out, and we really appreciate it. And I want to mention tonight's episode, like all of our episodes all season long, are brought to you by Mad Mushroom and The Shop. We'll get into, or I'll get into, uh, talking about those sponsors more later. But uh, let's kick things off and uh, start talking about uh, some basketball action. Mount Invitational, we've been talking about it for Past few weeks on the podcast, Purdue is going to be in Maui, or actually Honolulu, I should say, for the Maui Invitational, as the Maui Invitational got moved from Lahaina, Lahaina and uh, Maui area to Honolulu this year, where the University of Hawaii Rainbow Warriors play because of all the all the awful, tragic devastation that's happened to the Maui area. They weren't able to have it there like they usually do, so... Honolulu was the place, and from all accounts, from what I've seen and read on the internet, um, logistically speaking, uh, the Mount Invitational went on as smooth as could be. So that's uh, good news for everybody that was lucky enough to travel down to Hawaii to watch our Boilermakers in action. Start off Monday against Gonzaga, the uh, then 11th ranked Gonzaga Bulldogs, a team Purdue's familiar with just from last year. Purdue played them in the PK up uh, PK tournament up in uh, Oregon, in which Purdue won, if you recall, beating West Virginia Gonzaga and then Duke in the championship. Uh, Purdue was victorious over Gonzaga, 73-63. We did trail the big Bulldogs 35-30 to a half, but came out real strong in the second half, outscoring the Bulldogs 43-28. to Minute-wise, uh, Zach Eady was not the leader in minutes for the Boilermakers. That was sophomore point guard Braden Smith. Led all Boilermakers in the time on the floor with 35 minutes. Um, but Zach Eady did lead all scores with 25 points in 33 minutes of action. Shot 50% from the field, going 8 for 16 on field goals. It was 9 for 10 from the charity stripe from the free throw line. He had five offensive boards, nine defensive Boards for 14 rebounds. So 25 and 14, we'll take that out of the reigning defending National Player of the Year big man every single night. Rain Smith, like I mentioned, 35 points, 35 minutes, I should say. He had 13 points to go with those 35 minutes. He shot 6 of 8 from the field, 0 for 1 from behind the arc, 1 for 1 from the charity stripe. He also had 4 rebounds all defensively, 6 assists, and 5 steals to go with those 13 points. Uh, great game for Braden Smith. That's two years in a row. He's kind of got the better of Gonzaga, kind of dominated Gonzaga, and it sounded like by all accounts that Gonzaga was really giving him some trash talk from the bench, and he was giving it right back to them. And there's some rumors online, if not some facts, that Gonzaga tried to poach Braden Smith from Purdue in the offseason with a nice six-figure NIL offer. 
But luckily for us Purdue fans, Braden did not bite on that. As he probably saw that Purdue had a chance to do something really special during this 2023-2024 season. Other starters in the game, uh, Lance Jones played 26 minutes. Shot 6 for 14 from the field, 1 of 6 from behind the arc. He grabbed 4 four rebounds total, uh, 3 on the defensive side, 1 on the offensive side. Also had a one assist, two steals, 13 points overall. So he and Braden tied for second in the most points for Purdue. Uh, Fletcher Lawyer, 24 minutes of action on Monday night, 0 for 6 from the field, 0 for 3 from behind the arc, 2 for 2 free throw line. Uh, one rebound, one assist to uh, boot. So two points overall for Fletcher Monday night. And he was kind of hearing it from uh, Purdue fans online. Um, after that game Monday night, but uh, I'll get into it in just a minute. But spoiler alert, he bounced back big time in a big way the next two games. Uh, Trey Kaufman Wren also started at the power forward position. He had 13 minutes of action, shot three for six from the field, 0 for two from behind the arc, added three rebounds, so six points for him. Off the bench, Camden Heidi had uh, 11 minutes of action, one for one field goals. That was an alley oop, if I'm not mistaken. So two points, he also added two rebounds. Caleb first, 12 minutes of action, one for three from the field. Added uh, five rebounds, four of those on the defensive end, two steals, so two points for him. Mason Gilson, 21 minutes of action, had uh, four points on one of one shooting from the field, and one of one from behind the arc, and one of two from the free throw line. He also added two rebounds and three assists. And then Miles Colvin, the freshman, uh, came up, up with some big points off the bench. He had 13 minutes of action, two for five from the field, but both of those makes were from, be, uh, from behind the arc. He was two for four, also added three rebounds. And Ethan Morton also played 12 minutes of action, uh, didn't attempt a field goal, um, and the only stat he had was two personal fouls. So overall as a team, Purdue shot 46.7% from the field, only 23.5% from behind the arc, 4 for 17, and uh, 13 for 16 from the free throw line, 81.3%. Gonzaga shot 37.7% from the field, going 26 for 69, only 18.8% from behind the arc, 6 for 32. If I'm not mistaken, all six of those were in the first half, and they only shot eight free throws, so 5 for 8 from the free throw line for uh, 62.5%. So Purdue and Matt Painter, once again, got the best of Mark Few, uh, winning by a score of 73-63, which put them in a position they were going to get no worse than third in the Maui and put them against a foe that Purdue's been real familiar with, not in just basketball, but also football in the 2021 Music City Bowl and many other sports, volleyball, I know for a fact. That's a Tennessee Volunteers who are ranked seventh going into Tuesday's matchup in the Maui Invitational. Uh, Tennessee was previously victorious over the Syracuse Orange, so that's why Purdue matched up with them. And uh, Purdue was able to pull this game out by a final score of 71-67. Once again, two games in a row, Purdue was down at half, 31-30, but outscored the Volt. 41-36 in the second half. And now in this game, Fletcher Lawyer led all Boilermakers with minutes on the floor. And you might be thinking, well, he only had two points against Gonzaga. Didn't do a whole lot. Didn't shoot the ball well. Why did he play so many minutes against Tennessee? Well, this was Fletcher Lawyer's bounce back game as he had led all Boilers in scoring with 27 points. 7 for 18 from the field. 3 for 10 from behind the arc. 10 for 11 at the free throw line. He also grabbed six rebounds all defensively, added three steals to that as well. Great game for Fletcher. Great to see him bounce back. Great to see him hit that 27-point margin against the Volunteers like uh, certain uh, Boilermaker a few years ago in the 2019 tournament in the Ryan Klein did. Um, so great to – Great to see that. Um, he's got to be living in the nightmares of volunteer fans for many, many years to come. Uh, Zach Eady, second lead scorer for the Boymakers, 23 points. He also grabbed uh, 10 rebounds. Seven of those were offensively. He uh, played 26 minutes, shot 7 to 10 from the field, 9 for 17 from the free throw line. He opened the game 0 for 6 from the free throw line. So glad to see he finally hit a stride there. Uh, Braden Smith was the second minute getter uh, for Purdue, 35 minutes, and at six points, 
two for nine from the field, 0 for one from behind the arc, only two for six from the free throw line, missed uh, all four of those kind of late in the game. He did add five rebounds, four of those on the defensive end, one assist and three steals as well. Mitch Jones, 31 minutes, one for four from the field, one for three from behind the arc, one for two at the charity stripe. He added three rebounds, all on the defensive end, two assists, one steal. So he had four points on the night. Uh, Trey Kaufman ran, also started. Purdue started the same same lineup every game so far this year. Uh, Trey Kaufman added eight points in 21 minutes of action, two for seven from the field, did not attempt a three pointer, and he was, um, he was. Let's see here, uh, nine for 17 from the free throw. No, that's that's Zach Eady. Excuse me, four for eight from the free throw line, added eight rebounds, six of those defensive, two offensive. Um, two assists and one steal. Coming off the bench, Caleb first got 20 minutes of action. Um, only provided three points. He was over three from the field. Um, didn't attempt a three, and he was three for four from the free throw line. But he had four rebounds, one assist, and a lot of hustle plays. He just brought a good energy off the bench, made things flow a little bit, provide some athleticism, which he always provides. I think that's why he got so much run in, in this game. And then uh, Mason Gillis, 13, po- 13 minutes off the bench. He was held scoreless, over two from the field, over one from behind the arc. He did add three offensive rebounds and one assist. Uh, Camden Heidi, uh, no points, no attempted field goals or three pointers, seven minutes of action. Miles Colvin, also scoreless in six minutes of action, attempted one field goal, but uh, missed. And then Ethan Morton in five. Minutes of action, uh, also scoreless, but did add one block. So, uh, great to see Purdue off the hot start there in Maui. Uh, you know, being a number 11 ranked Gonzaga team and a seventh ranked Tennessee team. And we knew no matter what, going into the championship, the worst could, we could do was becoming a uh, runner up of the Maui Invitational, which would have been the second time in school history. Purdue would have done that. They played in the Maui in the late 90s and lost the championship game to North Carolina. They played in the Maui a couple of times since then, but never made the championship again um since and knew we we're gonna get a good a good opponent whether it be number four marquette or number one kansas i think a lot of purdue fans were hoping number one kansas just to try to beat hunter dickinson the transfer from michigan one more time but in the end uh marquette knocked off mich uh, knocked off kansas so shock is smart and the golden eagles a opponent purdue's very familiar with uh being this was the 12th meeting all time between purdue and the golden eagles here on wednesday and uh, they've met many, many times the last few years in the Gava games. And Purdue was victorious in a thrilling game, 78-75 to become Maui champions, Maui Invitational champions for the first time. Uh, Purdue was up 45-33 at half, so unlike the Gonzaga and the Tennessee games, Purdue was not trailing half. They were actually leading, but got outscored by Marquette 42-33 in the second half. But in the end, it doesn't matter. And actually, in the end, what – was a difference maker was Lance Jones' buzzer beater at halftime that was made from the opposite three-point line, which I believe, according to Alan Karpik of Golden Black, uh, as far as his records show and his knowledge, that was the longest shot made by a uh, Purdue Boilermaker in a game. So Lance Jones, 32 minutes of action, 11 points, like I said, three of those from the opposite three-point line, and it was a huge make looking back on it. It's four for nine from the field. Three for seven behind the arc. Did not shoot any free throws. Added one assist and two steals. Uh, Zach Eady led all uh, Boilermakers. Him and Fletcher Lawyer, I should say, in minutes played, 35 each. Uh, Zach had 28 points, 15 rebounds. Seven of those offensively, eight on defensive end. One steal, two blocks. 11 and 19 from the field, six of nine from the free throw line. Fletcher Lawyer in 35 minutes had 10 points. Four for ten shooting from the field, one for three from behind the arc, one for two at the charity line, free throw line. Uh, he had a two rebounds, both on the defensive end and one assist. Brady Smith played 34 minutes of action, was Purdue's second leading scorer with with 18 points, seven of eleven shooting from the field, four for six from behind the arc. Nice to see Braden. Braden's really improved his shot this year. That's the biggest takeaway I'm, I'm taking from his play so far is uh, not only does he look to be in more command of the offense, but his shooting has really, really improved. He was over one from the free throw line. He had five rebounds, four of those on the defensive end, five assists, 
to go along with his points. Trey Kaufman ran once again, same starting lineup. In 11 minutes of action, he had six points, two for two from the field, one of one from behind the arc, one of two at the free throw line, one rebound, two assists. Um, off the bench, Mason Gillis, 24 minutes of action, five points, two or six from the field, one of three from behind the arc, 0 for one at the free throw line, five rebounds, though, four of those defensively, two assists. So we saw Caleb first get a lot of minutes in a Tennessee game, and Mason not so much and kind of flip flopped in the Marquette game. And I think that's a trend we're going to see a lot in the power forward position, whether it be Trey Kaufman or in, Mason Gillis, Caleb first. Purdue is very deep at that power forward position. So I think it's just going to be game to game um, as far as matchups go. Who gets more playing time? You can go with the hot hand. I did notice, I thought, at least on Wednesday night against Marquette, the ball was moving a lot better when Mason was there. And Mason definitely doesn't hesitate to get that post look down low to Zach, which is really important. Other guys off the bench, Camden Heidi, nine minutes of action, zero points, 0 for 1 for the field, two rebounds, one assist. Caleb First also had nine minutes of action, did not attempt a shot, so he had zero points. But he added two rebounds. Uh, Miles Colvin, only four minutes of action for the freshman. No shots attempted. He had two assists, though. And then Ethan Morton, seven minutes of action, no points, over one shooting from the field, which was over one from behind the arc. So only five bench points for Purdue, and that was Mason Gillis. That's something to keep an eye on going forward for the Boilermakers. Overall shooting, the Boilers shot the ball well, 30 for 59 from, from the field for 50.8%. 10 for 21 from behind the arc for 47.6%. Only 8 for 15, so only shot 15 free throws, where I, I forgot to mention the shooting numbers against Tennessee, where Purdue shot 48 free throws, I believe it was, 46 or 48, I think it was 48. They only shot 15 this game, 53.3% uh, from behind the arc, which that Tennessee game was unwatchable at points. I mean, after Rick Barnes gets a technical, uh, Tennessee's coach Rick Barnes, uh, Tennessee gets the next eight foul calls in a row. Um, I mean, the Referees were blowing the whistle out of every chance they get. It was a extremely physical game. Felt like I was watching either a football game or an AEW pro wrestling match at times instead of a basketball game. But that game lasted darn near two and a half hours. And um, without overtime, that is just way too long for a college basketball game, in my opinion. Um, Marquette from the field shot 30 for 58 for 51.7%. Uh, from behind the arc, they're only 5 for 17 for 29.4%. They did shoot uh, only 11 Free throws, but they made 10 of those for 90.9%. So, I mean, I can't think of a better week in Purdue basketball history, at least definitely a consecutive day stretch. I mean, you beat the number 11 ranked team and the number 7th ranked team and the number 4 ranked team back to back to back. Uh, this was a loaded field, like like the commentators kept saying over and over again. A field that uh, you won't see much tougher of a field in, in Phoenix for the Final Four. And you can see a lot of these teams in the Final Four. I think Purdue's definitely capable of making the Final Four. Marquette's capable of making the Final Four. Tennessee's capable of making the Final Four. Kansas, who's also in the field, capable of making the Final Four. I even think Gonzaga. I mean, they might not be the Gonzaga of the last few years, but I still think they got experience. And Mark Few's a heck of a coach. Um, they're experienced enough and, and talented enough to make a run in March. Um, Syracuse, probably not. I... I doubt they even make the tournament if I had to go out on limb this year. UCLA took Marquette down to the wire. Marquette beat them by two on Monday night. UCLA should be a tournament team, one that could uh, also make a run. Uh, Mick Cronin's a good good coach out there. So and then you had Chaminade in the field as, as well, which, I mean, nobody expected anything out of them, but great experience for their players nonetheless. So great trip to Maui. Um, it's always fun when Purdue's in these big non-conference tournaments, especially Maui, which is, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, this year, I'd say, is, is the biggest one, nationally speaking, at least. So next year, Purdue will be in San Diego with a uh, field that includes uh, Notre Dame, Brigham Young, I believe, and, and somebody else. It's a four-team field. So, um, yeah, can't say um, much more about the basketball team. I mean, off to a great start this season, extremely exciting. Next week, they have Texas Southern coming into Mackey on Tuesday. Last I checked, Texas Southern had not won a game yet. And then uh, Purdue starts Big Ten action where, you know, the Big Ten likes to do two games right away in December. Then you finish out your non-con. Then you pick up conference play going forward in January. Purdue travels to Evanston to face Northwestern next Friday night at 9 o'clock. Uh, like I said, Purdue should be ranked number one in the polls this upcoming week. 
And if you remember correctly, last year, Northwestern knocked Purdue off their number one spot at Northwest at Evans in Evanston last year. So Purdue looking for some for some revenge there against Chris Collins in those uh, Wildcats who can be really really physical and and, uh, and and scrappy and pesky at times. But I think Purdue should have a really good crowd there. I think tickets are going for about hundred dollars a pop. Whereas the uh, football tickets for the football game last Saturday in Evanston between Purdue and uh, Nor- Northwestern uh, were not even going close to a fraction of that. So. Um, so yeah, so at Northwestern next Friday, like I mentioned, then the following Monday, December 4th, Purdue hosts the Iowa Hawkeyes, and then they'll end up going up to Canada and to Toronto on December 9th to play a neutral court game against, uh, Alabama, who's a very talented team. Then on December 16th, the Indy Classic down at Gamebridge Fieldhouse, the home of the Indiana Pacers, they'll play, uh, Arizona, who should be ranked number two. This upcoming week, um, they held off Michigan State yesterday on Thanksgiving, and what was a pretty good game. So, a lot of upcoming uh, tough matchups and challenges still ahead for the Boilers, but couldn't ask for a better start through, through uh, almost the end of November. So, uh, off and running. Let's just enjoy the journey. I know we keep hearing over and over again. Doesn't matter what they do during the regular season; only matters what happens. What happens in March matters, and I, and I get that. I get that. You know, Purdue's got to sit with it sit in it that they lost to Fairley Dickinson as a number one seed against 16 seed. I get it. You know, they lost St. Peter's the year before 15 seed. I get it. 13 seed in North Texas the year before. I get it. I get it. I get it. But this is a new team. This is a new year. And this team looks like they're going to, they are destined to do something special. So let's enjoy the journey every step of the way and we'll worry about March Madness when time comes. Before I switch gears and start talking about uh, Boilermaker football, let me tell you a little more about one of our sponsors of the podcast, which is Mad Mushroom. Mad Mushroom has been a sponsor of now the Boiler Breakdown for the last few years, and they've been serving Boilermaker since 1993. They're located in the heart of West Lafayette, and they're known as the home of the original cheese sticks. But whenever Andrew, Evan, or myself visit, we like to sit down, have an ice cold beer while trying out their latest pizza of the month, which Fitting, being that Thanksgiving is in November, the November pizza of the month is Tristan's Thanksgiving Feast. It is turkey gravy topped with corn, savory stuffing, hickory smoked turkey, and mozzarella and cheddar cheeses finished with parsley, For and that's just starting at $14. So I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving yesterday, but I know a lot of people like Thanksgiving food year-round, not just at Thanksgiving time. So if this pizza is up your alley, make sure to go get one. Actually, go get two of them and make your price over $20. And that way, when you stop in, tell them the Boiler Breakdown sent you, you get $5 off your order over $20. And if you're one of those people who likes to order your food online, you can use coupon code BREAK5, that's B-R-E-A-K-5, all caps for $5 off any order over $20 as well. So like I said, they got good pizza. They are known as the home of the original cheese stick, fantastic cheese sticks. They got good wings. They got good grinders. If you're not getting your food delivered and you're eating in there, they got good beer to drink as well. Can't go wrong with anything you get from Mad Mush. And that's Mad Mushroom, and their website's madmushroom.com. Mad Mushroom, feed your head. All right, uh, Purdue football. Um, let's be honest, the season has not gone the way any of us fans were hoping. Um, having a 3-8 and eight record going into old oak and buckets, I think many fans were hoping to have at least five wins coming into this week to where you can beat your arch rival Indian Hoosiers, make a bowl game. But unfortunately, Purdue was just on the short stick of some of those close games that looking back, they could have definitely got one of those games being this game this past weekend, um, last Saturday in Evanston against Northwestern, which Purdue lost by a final score of 23 to 15. Um, but Purdue got some, uh, negative, unfortunate news, uh, Saturday morning before the game that quarterback Hudson card and um, edge rusher, Nick Scorton were both not going to be able to suit up against the Wildcats. So you're taking away your starting quarterback and um, arguably your best defender, either Nick Scorton or, or Kydron Jenkins. We knew it was going to be uphill battle just, just from the get go, because you're looking at starting 
Bennett Meredith and Ryan Brown, which that was announced shortly before kickoff. That everybody think, I think, just uh, figured that Bennett Meredith, the redshirt freshman transfer from Arizona State, would get his first collegiate start, um, in which he did start the game. So that is that is true. But it was, I think it was kind of surprising that um, freshman Ryan Brown was in the mix as well. And uh, both guys saw action. Uh, they for a while they were going back and forth, series to series which I didn't really care for. I kind of wish they would have gave, gave uh, Bennett the first quarter, Ryan the second quarter, then at halftime, assuming the game was close like like it actually was, uh, then you make up your mind who you're going to go with and who's going to lead you out in the second half. But instead, they're going series to series, and I just think that's hard for an offense, especially a quarterback, to get in the rhythm. Um, but the stat line for both guys looked like this. Excuse me, Bennett's... Uh, Meredith was uh, had, through five completions on seven attempts for 36 yards. Uh, his lawn through the air was 21, and he had uh, four rushing attempts for seven yards. Ryan Brown, 12 completions on 16 attempts for 104 yards. He did throw two interceptions, including one which he was trying to take the Boilermakers down, the final drive of the game to potentially tie the game up, taking the overtime. His longest completion of the day was 28 yards. Bennett Meredith did take two sacks. Ryan Brown took one. Ryan Brown definitely was more mobile quarterback of the two. He had 85 rush yards on 21 carries. Um, his long rush attempt was 12 yards. Speaking of rushing attempts, back-to-back -back games now, the Purdue Boilermakers have ran for over 300 yards on the ground. Who would have thought that coming into this year? Um, just really historically any Purdue team um, hadn't seen really a strong rushing attack since 2012, Danny Hope's final year with Akeem Shavers and Akeem Hunt and Raheem Mostert. Um, and and here we are, back-to-back -back games against Minnesota and Northwestern. Purdue has had over 300 yards on the ground. They had 54 rush attempts for 303 yards, um, led by Tyron Tracy Jr., 16 attempts for 160 yards and one touchdown. He's having a heck of a season. Um, I really wish he would have stayed healthy against Iowa, see what he could have done after the first quarter in that game, which was a close 20 to 14 loss. And then he was banged up against Ohio state the next week and had to sit out or due to get getting banged up in the Iowa game. He had to sit out, I should say, which I don't think he, it would have really mattered. Unfortunately that day as, as Purdue got blown out by the Buckeyes at home, but I I'm going to go on a limb and say Tyron Tracy will be playing on Sundays next year. I think a lot of, from what I've read, NFL scouts have been interested in him and I think he's good enough and had a good enough season. He's good enough on special teams. He has, he's quick enough he's um he's got enough athleticism that he can be a late round pick for somebody on day three of the nfl draft so hopefully my denver broncos we need we need more purdue boilermakers devin mockaby crazy legs added 54 yards on 12 attempts he also had one touchdown his long run of the day was 14 yards and i should mention tyron tracy jr's longest run of the day was 62 yards so like i said 303 yards for purdue on the ground on 54 carries for two touchdowns receiving uh, Devin Mockaby was the leading receiver uh, yardage wise with 44 reception yards or receiving yards on three receptions. Uh, the longest reception for him was 25 yards. Then Tyron Tracy jr. Was second with 38 receiving yards on four receptions. 28 yards was his longest reception. So he had the longest reception of the day for the Boilermakers. TJ Sheffield won your reception for 21 yards. And uh, it was just, um, announced this week, or he announced, I should say, on his social media that I, I'm not sure if he's going to be playing the bucket game tomorrow or not because he is putting his name in the transfer portal. He's got one year left as a graduate transfer, and he's put his name in the portal to finish his collegiate career somewhere outside of West Lafayette, Indiana. So bummed to see that, but uh, but hopefully TJ lands somewhere where he can uh, possibly be the number one guy, if not the number two guy, because I think he's starting to kind of fall down the depth chart for Purdue as the, as the years went on. Uh, Garrett Miller, uh, 17 receiving yards on four receptions. Deion Burks, 13 yards on four receptions. Armad Branch, seven yards on one reception. And Jaden Dixon Veal um, played but did not have any receptions. Uh, defensively, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, true freshman sensation Dylan Thieneman was the leading tackler with 10 tackles. He had six solo and four assisted tackles. He also had Purdue's lone interception on the day. Yanni Karloff, this four tackle, uh, six total tackles, excuse me. Sanusi Kane, six tackles. Cajun Jenkins, four tackles. Kodore Sindor, four tackles. 
Zeon Septo, who was just a wide receiver to start this year, four tackles, three tackles, excuse me. Um, Cam Allen, two tackles. Tony Stevens, two tackles. Derek Rogers Jr., two tackles. Um, yeah, so uh, Yanni Karlaftis had one sack. Kydron Jenkins, half sack. Um, Sindor, two sacks. And um, Armande, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Um, he had a one and a half sacks as well. Jack Ansel punting uh, three punts for 130 yards. Salon was 40, 56, averaged 43.3 yards per punt. Um, return wise, uh, Purdue had uh, one punt return. TJ Sheffield for no yards. Um, kickoffs, uh, Tyron Tracy had four kickoff returns for 78 yards, with a lawn being 23 yards. Uh, ben Freehill, um, 0 for 1 on field goals, missed a 44 yarder. He did kick off three times for the Boilermakers. Boilermakers, yeah, did not attempt any other field goals in the game because they went for it every time they were in field goal range and didn't go so well for the offense that is uh, coordinated by Graham Harrell. Um, I just don't understand why Purdue, who is lacked in the power run game, keeps trying to run out of shotgun. Third and short, fourth and short. It's just not working very well. Um, looking at the numbers here, um, let's see here. Third down conversions, Purdue was 6 of 16. And on fourth down conversions, they were 2 of 5. Red zone uh, scoring chances, they had four of them, only converted, converted two. So that's not going to win you a lot of ball games, especially close ball games. Whereas Northwestern was five for 15 on third downs. They didn't have any fourth down attempts to convert, uh, but they were uh, two for three in the red zone. So and they uh, were one for two of field goals. And like I said, Purdue was 0 for 1 in the field goals. Um, Northwestern had two interceptions. Like I said, Purdue had one. Um, total offense, Purdue outgained Northwestern 443 yards to 329. Purdue ran 77 plays compared to Northwestern's 59. Um, Purdue even averaged more yards per play than Northwestern, 5.8 yards compared to Northwestern's 5.6 yards. Purdue did fumble it four times and lost two of them. Uh, Northwestern fumbled once, but recovered their own fumble. Penalties, uh, Purdue had five penalties for 40 yards. Northwestern had four for 30 yards. Uh, Northwestern threw for 230 yards through the air compared to Purdue's 140. That is net yardage. Uh, but uh, rushing, Purdue 303 to Northwestern's 99. Purdue had 21 first downs compared to Northwestern's 12. 16 of those 21 uh, first downs came on the ground. Um, Northwestern, also eight of their 12 first downs came in the air. So yeah, overall, just a frustrating game for the Boilermakers. Um, a game they should have had, game I thought they outplayed their opponent, and that's not the first time. I think we can say that this year where Purdue outplayed their opponent but came up on the losing end. So it is what it is. Northwestern and David Braun, who is now their full-time coach, he got the interim tag pulled off of him last week. They are going bowling. That was their sixth win, giving them a record of 6-5 and five going into their rivalry game with Illinois tomorrow. And the Boilers are 3-8. and eight. So the best they can do this year is 4-8, and eight, no bowl whatsoever. Um, I mean, the door was pretty much shut anyways without getting six wins, but there was still a, a slimmer hope they could go five and seven and make a bowl if not enough teams were eligible with six and six records, but that door has slammed shut. The Big Ten's going to have plenty of teams at five and seven, if not six and six records. So the best Purdue can do is beat Indiana tomorrow, be four and eight, and have the old Ogun bucket at least um, to keep in their trophy case along with uh, Purdue Cannon. The Chilele has been in Notre Dame's possession since 2021, uh, which Purdue will host Notre Dame next year, and um, hopefully they can get that trophy back. It would be the first time they beat the Fighting Irish since 2007, if they do so. But looking forward to tomorrow's matchup against the Indiana Hoosiers, who are also 3-8. and eight. So we're going to see two teams with a combined record of 6-16 six and 16 tomorrow going head-to-head. -head. But all-time, Purdue leads the series 70 Six wins, the 42 losses, and six ties. All-time at Ross A, Purdue leads with 39 wins, 23 losses, and four ties. Purdue's on a two-game win streak in this rivalry. They uh, beat the Hoosiers down Bloomington last year by a score of 30-16. to They clinched their first ever Big Ten West title. The year before that was a drilling on senior day in West Lafayette, 44-7. to uh, Before that, 2020 was not played due to the, due to the COVID season, the pandemic. Uh, 2019, uh, 
a bad Purdue team that went four and eight, took one of Indiana's better teams in recent memory to the wire, a double overtime loss, 44, 41 back in 2018 and 2017, Jeff Brom's first two years, Purdue's victorious 28, 21, 31, 24. Um, so the last time these two programs faced where neither one could make a bowl or would be playing in a bowl, you got to go back to 2014 in Bloomington in which the Hoosiers won a tight one, 23 to 16. If you recall, both Daryl Hazel's first two bucket games, 13 and 14, were on the road. Um, it was that weird year where with adding Rutgers of Maryland, they redid the schedules, and for whatever reason, Purdue went – on the road twice. Never did get two home games back to back consecutively to make up for that. But you got to go back to 2014, which is interesting because, uh, 2015, 2016, Purdue did not make a bowl, but Indiana did 2017. Both teams came in this matchup five and six. Purdue was victorious, went to a bowl 2018. Purdue went to a bowl. Indiana did not 2019. Indiana went to a bowl. Purdue did not 21 and 22. Uh, Purdue both uh, went to bowl both years. Indiana did not. Other years, kind of like this year, I was looking back in history. Uh, 2012, 2011, Purdue made bowls. Indiana did not. 2010, 2009, and 2008, all three years in a row, neither team made a bowl. Um, 2007, both teams made a bowl. 2006, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 2000, 99, 98, 97. All those years, Purdue made a bowl. Indiana did not. So, just interesting. I mean, I just saw a lot of people on on Twitter and and Facebook and all over the internet saying, "Oh, three and eight, three and eight. How fitting. We're used to this. Not really. Not too many times. If you look historically, I mean, neither. Very rarely are both teams really good coming into the matchup. But usually, at least one team's had a pretty pretty decent season. But uh, not the case right now, uh, unfortunately. But uh, still looking forward to the game tomorrow. West Lafayette. It's always fun to. Go down to West Lafayette for the final time. Bucket game's fun. Uh, I don't anticipate too many Hoosier fans being in tennis, maybe a couple thousand, but um, not as many as game, for instance, in 2019 when Indiana was pretty good and Purdue wasn't. But um, looking at some team st- statistics for the year, I got to think um, Purdue's going to be able to score on Indiana, uh, particularly if Hudson Card is available, which by all accounts he and Nick Scorton will be uh, green light, ready to go for tomorrow's game. Um, this Indiana team's interesting. First half of the year, they were their defense was pretty solid. Their offense was not. And for whatever reason, the last few weeks it looks like it's flipped as they've been able to put up points on their opponents but hasn't haven't been able to stop a nosebleed. Um, they averaged 21.4 points per game to t- produce 22.9 points per game. Purdue has 252 points on the season. Indiana, 235. Total touchdowns, Purdue has 34. Indiana, 29. Um, passing yards, uh, Indiana's net passing yards, 2,327 to produce 2,259, uh, rushing yards. Like I said, produced fourth in the big 10 rushing. Um, who would have guessed that they have 1,847 rushing yards and Indiana's 1,318 rushing yards. Um, Looking uh, at just penalties on the season, Purdue has a total of 68 penalties for 641 penalty yards. Indiana has 58 penalties for 537 penalty yards. They average 48 penalty yards per game. Purdue averages 58 penalty yards per game. Uh, Time of possession, uh, Purdue averages 30 minutes and 11 seconds for time of possession per per game. Indiana, 29 minutes and 38 seconds. Seconds. A uh, few other miscellaneous things. Indiana's turnover ratio is minus two. They have 18 fumbles and have lost eight of those. Purdue's minus three. They've had 20 fumbles and lost eight of those this season. Um, trying to see here. Um, this doesn't have any defensive statistics, unfortunately, on the site I'm looking at. But I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good about this game. Um, and, you know, we usually do a spicy bowl prediction on the podcast. And I know I've done this one before, but since he was out last week against Northwestern, and in hindsight, I think if Hudson Card was able to play, Purdue wins that game relatively easy against Northwestern. But Hudson Card back in action under center against the Hoosiers. I think Hudson Card goes over 300 yards for only the second time this season. The other game he did that was in a loss at home against Syracuse back in September. 
but I think Hudson Card gets it done through the air. That's my spicy bowl prediction. And as far as my score prediction, I think Purdue gets this one done by a score of 31 to 20. Last I checked, point spread had Purdue by two and a half point favorites, but let me go check that right now. Um, so I have Purdue, of course, covering the spread with winning 31 to 20. Uh, let's see here. Purdue's up to a five point favorite. So that tells you I have not checked in a couple days. This game, once again, is at noon on the Big Ten Network. Um, so feeling good about it. Feeling good about the Boilers. Hang on to the old Oakland bucket. Um, you know, I don't know how important momentum is in college football anymore with the world of of the transfer portal and NIL and your roster turnover being so hectic and heavy year to year. But I think rivalry games are still very important when you're trying to get portal transfers and in particular just recruits in general. So especially in state, Ryan Walters and company have been on record saying that they're going to try to put a gate, put a fence, I should say, around the state of Indiana and keep a lot of the in-state talent home. So, so these things matter. Rivalry games matter. I mean, I know Purdue, Indiana rivalry is bigger on the hardwood basketball, but uh, still got to take some pride on the gridiron too. Still a very fun, fun rivalry. So um, with all that said, um, lastly, I want to give you some more information about the other sponsor of the podcast, that is The Shop. The Shop's been open since 2011, and they bring they have brought everybody vintage-inspired sports, collegiate, and pop culture apparel made from high-quality materials. They're based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Their dedicated team is here to serve us at their retail locations and their headquarters. They take a holistic approach to the design and manufacturing process to make sure that each item is not just a product, but a reflection of the person who owns it. You can visit either one of their retail stores in Carmel or Broad Ripple. Their Carmel store is located at 836 South Range Line Road in Carmel and on Broad Ripple at 918 Broad Ripple Avenue in Indianapolis, Indiana. So I'm wearing one of their hats today. I got from the shop. Um, like I said, they make great hats, great t-shirts, drinkware. Um, I'm looking at some of their holiday items right now, their vintage items. I mean, just talking collegiately, they got items from Purdue, Indiana, Ball State, Butler, DePaul, Wabash, just to name a few. They got Pacers gear. They got Colts gear. They got Indy 500 gear. Um, you name it, they probably got it. Hats, drinkware, Beverage holders, flags, pennants, stickers, lawn sleeve, t-shirts, sweatshirts, jackets, tank top, accessories. They even got gift cards. So a gift card from the shop or something from the shop is the perfect Christmas gift to the sports fan in your family or the sports friend you have out there. So uh, we are now almost exactly a month away from Christmas. So get to shopping. And if you order online at shopindy.com and use promo code BREAKDOWN, that's in all caps, you get 25% off your first order. So make sure you get those orders in in time for Christmas. All right, everybody. With that said, it's been a fun week for Boilermaker Sports. Let's cap it off with a fun weekend. Let's go beat the Hoosiers. Let's retain the bucket. Boiler up, hammer down.